we're getting now, Graham. Over to you, Graham. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this annual lecture in memory and with thanksgiving for the life and ministry of Ken Leach. This lecture is the result of an ecumenical partnership. I'm Graham Sparks, president of the Luther King Centre in Manchester, one of those partners. Uh, the Luther King House Centre is uh, a place that offers many varied opportunities for theological study and formation, particularly in contextual theology that mirrors Ken Leach's own commitments and concerns. Do search us out on the internet, find out more about the opportunities for study we offer, not least our new MA programme in chaplaincy studies that's proving attractive to many. We're open to all, so do feel free to find out more about us. This evening we're partnering with St Chrysostom's and with the Society of Catholic Priests to bring this lecture. And uh, I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague Ian Gomesog, Ian who ministers at St Chrysostom's, who will introduce the background to our lecture and also the one who is giving this evening's particular lecture. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Graham. And welcome everybody to this year's Ken Leach lecture. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce it. The lecture was inaugurated to honor the work of Father Ken Leach notable community theologian and a challenging Anglo-Catholic priest. He founded the Jubilee Group um, to encourage and develop Christian social thought, especially uh, as it arose from an Anglo-Catholic outlook and context, but going well beyond that. And I'm delighted to welcome Bishop Rowan Williams to deliver this third Ken Leach lecture. Um, particularly delighted as Rowan himself was influenced and encouraged and took part in the writings of the Jubilee Group to such uh, an extent that um, government intelligence raised a few questions about Rowan and whether he was um, perhaps over-influenced by extreme left-wing views. Perhaps we'll make a judgment on that uh, at the end of the evening. However, it's my delight to welcome Rowan, who of course we will know as a former Archbishop of Canterbury and re relatively recently retired Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge. Rowan's done many, uh, much writing and continues to write and has expressed his delight at being asked to give this lecture. A just a few quick notes uh, for those who are following. You may post questions through Facebook and comment there. And then my colleague here, Meg, will um, be asking Rowan those questions after the lecture. We are an international audience this evening and a great number have registered for the lecture. So it may be that your question may not actually be able to be answered. Those who have registered will get an email afterwards to say how we may, for example, follow up on Zoom with some conversation among those who have attended about the issues raised and about how you can get a recording. More about that later. For now, it is my delight 
to welcome Bishop Rowan to give the third of the Kenley lectures entitled Solidarity. Ian, thank you very much indeed for that introduction and thank you Graham also for your welcome. As you've said, Ian, it's a great personal pleasure as well as a privilege to be invited to commemorate Ken, a very dear friend over many years, a great influence in any number of ways on my own thinking and action. And I am very happy to dedicate this lecture to his memory. I shall be talking a little bit about some of his ideas, um, but in the context of a rather more general approach to the question that my title indicates. Solidarity as an ethical ideal is, we might say, a little bit of a newcomer to Christian ethics. And its introduction into the mainstream of discourse about Christian social ethics owes an enormous amount to Pope John Paul II. In his famous encyclical on social ethics, Solicitudo Re Socialis, he says, there is no true peace without fairness, truth, justice, and solidarity. And the Pope in other places notes that to talk about solidarity is more than simply talking about what he calls a vague feeling of compassion. We we'll see a little bit later the difference between talking about solidarity and simply talking about feelings of compassion. And he also said that the basic principles of any Christian ethic were dignity, solidarity, and subsidiarity. That's in a text of 1999. His interest in this theme of solidarity was picked up, perhaps to some people's surprise, by his successor, Pope Benedict, who in a 2008 address to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, again spoke of solidarity as a fundamental pillar in Christian social ethics and defined it in terms of what enabled the human family to share both material and spiritual goods. So if we look at the last 20 to 30 years, we can see that this theme of solidarity as a foundational point in Christian social ethics has come more and more into focus. Pope John Paul II himself notes that it echoes what Catholic social teaching earlier in the century had spoken of in terms rather of friendship or in Pope Paul VI's phrase, social charity. But it doesn't take any very great sophistication to realize that for Pope John Paul II, the word itself had a very specific and a very local importance and resonance. Coming as he did from Poland, where the Solidarnost movement had been a central element in resistance to the communist government. The Pope quite clearly saw solidarity as a term whose resonances and implications took us rather more deeply into some of the practicalities of Christian social action as well as Christian social theology. But that of course is a reminder that the word solidarity has a very active life right outside the theological world. The great anarchist theorist Kropotkin made a great deal of solidarity as a fundamental principle in the ethics of the labor movement. And we will all be familiar with the way in which not least in the British labor movement, that ideal of solidarity has been in the background of a great deal of action, reflection, and critique in the last century and more. In this context, solidarity, the solidarity of the working class, the solidarity of different working populations, of the unions and so on, solidarity denotes something a bit more than what the Catholic social teaching use might suggest. In this connection, solidarity is perhaps better seen as what I might call a radical shared interest. Solidarity is what comes into focus 
when people recognize that a policy or a decision that affects one individual or group actually affects a much larger number and appropriate actions follow from that. The idea of a general strike is based on the notion of working solidarity. And as I said, we will remember those occasions when strike action was often justified in terms of solidarity with another union, another working group. And that's because of this recognition of shared interest. What affects them affects us. And so the action that is required is action in which we have to share with those most directly affected. To put it slightly differently, solidarity in this connection means a willingness to share risk. An element which, again, I think is not so much in focus in the usage we've looked at in Catholic social teaching, not incompatible with it, but going rather further. But if we speak of solidarity as something which entails that willingness to share a risk, that recognition of a deep common interest, then the word is not just descriptive. There is an evaluative and an imperative dimension to it. Sociologists in the tradition of Emil Durkheim have treated solidarity simply as whatever it is that makes for or conserves social cohesion. But in the legacy that comes from Kropotkin, and other kinds of leftist thinking about solidarity, you could say it's much more a conscious policy, not a description of what makes for cohesion, but a policy of seeking more than cohesion, but participation and equity. It's a policy of moral identification. And above all, it recognizes the interdependence of the good of the goals and well-being of different individuals and different groups. The meaning of the word moves from simply cohesion, far more obviously in the direction of mutuality. So if we're seeking to define the word solidarity and to learn how to use it more effectively in a theological context, the context of theological ethics, the context Ken Leach contributed so colossally to. We need, yes, to take on board its significance, its enhanced significance in Catholic social teaching in the last few decades, but also to consider its meaning and its force in that particular kind of tradition, which I've already mentioned, which has to do with recognizing shared interest and undertaking shared risk. The meaning I've said moves from simply cohesion in the direction of mutuality. But another and much more theologically charged word for mutuality is communion. Many of you will know Ken Leach's superb chapter on solitude and solidarity in his collection The Sky is Red to my mind, one of his most important books. And in that essay on solitude and solidarity, Ken, referring to a very significant, but sadly largely forgotten Anglican social theologian of the earlier 20th century, Vigo de Mant, points out that the solidarity Christians are interested in is not something which is created out of the cooperation of separated units. It is something which fights back against what is destroying a solidarity that is already given. In other words, solidarity is not so much an ideal we set before ourselves, a kind of togetherness that we aim at. Solidarity is something which already exists in the very charter of our humanity. And that's why action for the sake of solidarity is not about creating something new, but resisting those forces that divide 
and undermine a mutuality already given by God. Because human beings, from and in virtue of their very creation, are in solidarity, bound to one another. The kind of beings we are as human is the kind of beings whose good depends on one another, whose fate is intertwined, whose interest is shared. And I'll just mention there in passing the parallels to this in some Eastern Orthodox thinking of the 19th and 20th centuries. And note the way in which this is developed by that great saint and martyr, Mother Maria Skaptsova of Paris, who ended her life because of her advocacy and work with Jewish refugees in a Nazi concentration camp in 1944. Shared interest, you could say, is always and already written in to the human enterprise. We cannot be human at all without the reality of that shared interest. And if we fail to recognize that shared interest, that interdependence of our goals and our well being, we become less than human. Later on in The Sky is Red, Ken Leach quotes from that formidable Anglo Catholic socialist and literary scholar, Valerie Pitt, on how. The social project is always more than just a matter of economic distribution. It's about the sharing of power. Because only in the sharing of power can we fully understand how shared interest works and some of the mechanisms that destroy the full recognition of shared interest and divide us from one another fostering the illusion that we can attain our goals and sustain our well-being without any acknowledgement of what we owe to others, what we owe to them in terms of what they need from us, what we owe to them in the much more direct sense of what they have given to us and will give to us and need to give to us. Mutual need is part of the picture of our humanity. And if that is so, then we need, we need to build a humanity in which everyone is free to give what they have to give into the need of the neighbor. Henry Pitt, as I've said, insists that a true social vision, a true socialist vision for her must always take us beyond mere distribution of goods. It must be about the distribution of liberty. It must be about a true sharing in the decision making which sets all of us free together. And to say that the social project is about more than economics is again something which Ken Leach has a good deal to say about as early as some of his works on spiritual direction. So that in Soul Friend, he notes that a robust, theologically informed and durable politics has to be about lifestyle, identity and supportive solidarity. Ken Leach then gives us a good deal to go on in thinking about how solidarity might be filled out as an ideal, as a recognition about our humanity. And in the next part of what I want to say, I'm going to suggest that he does this partly by a kind of negative theology. That is, he tells us in various ways what solidarity is not. We come to understand it better if we distinguish it clearly from three things. So solidarity, first of all, is not communitarianism. Secondly, it's not simply the language of the common good. And thirdly, it's not the same as empathy. Now, Ken offers 
a sympathetic critique of all these three. He's not saying that solidarity, solidarity has nothing to do with them, but he is pointing out some very important lines of distinction that have to be drawn between the sort of vision already sketched and these three temptingly similar and often related ideals or hopes. Each of them has important things to say. Each is inadequate on its own. Each needs to be supplemented by that strong sense of an imperative to shared risk, which I've already mentioned. So let's look at these three negations in turn. Solidarity is not the same as communitarianism. Ken writes in several places about his somewhat ambiguous relation to the communitarian tradition, and notes also how very loosely and inaccurately the term is thrown around. Communitarianism of the kind associated especially with writers like Amitai Etzioni is primarily a way of saying that human good is always to be understood in terms of shared goods. And so far, that is something which Ken would approve of. But the problem is that it can become an uncritical affirmation of the community you happen to be in. It can just be about the cohesiveness of the familiar group, accepting forms of belonging that already exist. Now, we've seen that as Demant says, and Ken Leach echoes, it's true at one level that solidarity is about a form of belonging that already exists. But our problem is not that it doesn't exist, our problem is that we have subverted it, frustrated it, and need to relearn it. The difficulty in some kinds of communitarian rhetoric, so Ken suggests, is that we assume that there are existing social forms which give us all we really need. There's not enough edge of transformation at work here. And so, as he says, communitarianism can be vulnerable to racism and xenophobia of various kinds. The intense sense of togetherness in a local community can be toxic when it is turned against the stranger. Ken writes here with a difficult unsentimentality about some of the working class communities he has known. Their intense sense of mutuality and mutual obligation can coexist with exactly that deep suspicion and hostility to the outsider. Some people have noted that in the last 15 years or so, the strongly communitarian and folk-oriented politics of the Scandinavian countries have bred a deep suspicion and hostility towards migrants. If you don't happen already to be part of the communitarian arrangement, you are vulnerable. So if it's true that, as Ken says, communitarianism can slip into promoting what he calls a normative view of sameness, communitarianism is not quite the answer, not quite the same as a solidarity which recognizes an unlimited shared interest among human beings as such. And just in passing, Ken notes that an uncritical communitarian philosophy can be very bad news not only for the minority, the stranger, the migrant, but also has a rather indifferent record on issues to do with gender and the power questions that arise around gender identities. What then, secondly, about the language of the common good? At first sight, being critical or wary about language concerning the common good seems to pull against 
a lot of what is most significant and critically helpful in political discourse. That's to say, it's increasingly common to read books that lament the disappearance of ideas of the common good and which, which argue that our social health depends on recovering that sense of common good. In other words, we have let ourselves drift into a kind of social consensus in which we've forgotten that what is good for one group can't be bad and destructive for another if we're looking for a just and sustainable society. There have to be things which we can only enjoy together, which make no sense as the projects of individuals or subgroups in society, but which have to be regarded as shared benefits or nothing. Part of the revolution of the welfare state in post-war Britain with all its shadows and ambiguities was a recognition that there are some goods, public health above all, which can't be franchised, broken up and regarded as simply vulnerable to the capacity, the resource, the prosperity of individuals or particular interest groups. But here's Ken's critical question. Talking about the common good is going to be at best premature if it fails to look at the real collisions that there are here and now between the good of diverse groups, classes, genders, and so on. To move too quickly to speaking about the common good can sidestep some of the necessary conflict, the necessary negotiation, and the necessary discovery and rediscovery that we need for that common good to be genuinely common, not simply something defined by those who already have power and privilege and passed on to others. Just as with communitarianism, language about the common good can be static. It can assume that we already know what is good for everyone before we start. Whereas in fact, there is a process of discovery, as I've already mentioned, that has to be undertaken here. We need to know not just what we think is good for everyone, but how the voices of those who haven't been part of a conversation about this can be incorporated and make a difference to how we understand what together we aim at and what together we work for. Both of these discussions of communitarianism and the ideal of the common good merit some further reflection, I would say, in the light of the politics of the last few years, not least in connection, let's say, with Brexit. As we have learned to recognize, part of the crisis and perhaps the tragedy of the Brexit discussion and outcome was the mutual non-communication between on the one side, a bland assumption about the shared goods of membership in the European Union, which didn't gain very much traction with a large part of the population. And on the other side, that deep sense of disconnection from political discourse and suspicion of those who spoke in those terms. Communitarianism and appeal to the common good didn't offer any very helpful insights in that particular debate. It could be said that some of the pro-Brexit argument, the pro-Brexit culture, we could say, was in some respects deeply rooted in a communitarian sensibility. It could be said too that for some, the ideal of a common good for the people of this nation was bound up with a refusal of a common good with the people of continental Europe. Rather more than these ideals was needed in order 
to develop that genuine sense of a universal mutuality, which solidarity designates in both the theological and the non-theological setting. In other words, to pick up a point I've made more than once, neither communitarianism nor the language of the common good can itself be a critical moral place to begin. Critical in the sense of inviting us to look long and hard at the assumptions about our togetherness from which we begin. The ideal of universal solidarity and the ideal of universal human communion, which theologians wish to promote, is something which requires us always to be asking where the boundaries are in the communities we currently belong to. Not because we want to dissolve those communities, certainly not in the name of any sort of individualism, but because there's always the question, is this community yet capacious enough to deal with that basic human reality of solidarity? But what then about the third of Ken's negative points? We've seen that Pope John Paul II insists that solidarity is not just a vague feeling of compassion. And there's been a good deal of writing, especially in the last 10 years or so, on the subject of empathy as a moral ideal. Much has been made of the fact that any number of moral problems require us to educate ourselves in a deeper and fuller degree of empathy. But the problem here is precisely that educating oneself in feelings about the feelings of others may, as it were, fold back upon itself. It can turn into another individualized and self-regarding exercise. It can be an attempt to absorb someone else's experience into my own. I know how you feel can be a deeply helpful thing for someone to say. It can also be a deeply demeaning thing for someone to say. I know how you feel, so you have nothing to tell me. I know how you feel, so I can stop listening. Of course, that's a caricature of what people want empathy to mean. And yet, it's right that we should apply the same kinds of skepticism to that language as we do to other kinds of aspirational language. Empathy, if it seeks to absorb the other into my own experience, instead of letting the otherness of someone else's situation speak to me as what it really is, empathy can be not only unhelpful, but destructive. The paradox is that it is when I see the real otherness of someone else's need and pain, when I recognize that it is not mine and is not even like mine, and yet in that very moment know that my response to that is part of what will release or heal me. That's when solidarity becomes a reality. I see that the other person is not me. I see that their pain is something I may never fathom. My own experience provides me with few or no parallels to the agony that I witness. And yet, I know that there is a shared interest, that the other person's liberation is something I must act for and struggle for with the same passion as I would act and struggle for my own liberation and my own healing. The otherness of somebody else's pain, somebody else's need, is irreducibly related to mine, but it's not the same. So shared interest, once again, has to be discovered as something that lies deeper than 
mere fellow feeling. And once again, we're reminded also of the significance in all this of the imperative to stand alongside. Standing alongside really does mean recognizing that the one you're standing with isn't you. It's what the word alongside means. And of course, issues around this have been very much in people's minds in the last 12 months or so, as we've reflected on the challenges of racial injustice and exclusion. By what right, some would say, by what right does the white person presume to support the black? We can only be together if we recognize that while we take risks for one another, we can't simply speak for one another or absorb the experience of the other into our own. Empathy is not enough. As many would say, in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement, to be an ally in this is to be open to challenge and to change. And once again, it is to stand with, not to stand instead of, not to seek always to speak for someone else, but to speak and stand with, and sometimes to be silent and stand with. Ken never discusses this directly, but I hear in this some echoes of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's reflections in his fragments on ethics about the idea of representation. Christians are called in Christ to be representatives. That is, they are to stand for the suffering and the vulnerable of the world. In the Germany of the 1930s, they are unambiguously to stand for the Jewish brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. They are always to look for those who are not given voice or place. But, and this is a crucial but, this is not to say that they themselves then become the focus of action and interest. They represent, they take responsibility, not so as to silence or displace the other, but quite the contrary. Their responsibility, their representation, is to guarantee as best they can that the other's voice is heard, to direct their own activity, their own advocacy towards letting that voice be what it is. These are complex areas that require a lot more discussion than we can give them on this occasion. But I hope that it's reasonably clear how Ken Leach wants to disentangle ideas of solidarity from being reduced to any one of these three versions. Each of them, in a different way, Ken would say, lacks a full doctrine of communion. That is a full doctrine of the absolute mutuality of humanity. Ultimately, in theological terms, this rests on the theological principle that every single human subject is made in God's image. And if that's the case, every single human subject has something of God to deliver to every other human subject to deliver a word of healing, acceptance, welcome, release, whatever we may say. We need that from one another as surely as we need the air we breathe and the food we eat. Simply talking about communitarian values or common good or fellow feeling fails to come to terms with what I called earlier that fundamental need for one another. And when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount blesses those who are hungry and thirsty for justice, we should take that phraseology with the utmost seriousness. Hunger and thirst are about need. 
about what we cannot live without. And to understand solidarity in terms of shared interest, mutuality, and common risk is to understand something of why we should speak of this in terms of a need in all of us, for all of us. And that solidarity, as we've seen, is something given in creation, lost in the history of human betrayal that begins with the fall, restored in Christ. We could say, echoing another phrase popular with some sociologists, we could say that Christian solidarity is the solidarity of an imagined community, not just the reflection or the idealizing of an existing community, but the imagined community is not just a distant aspiration in the future. What we are imagining is a fundamental fact about our humanity. And when we lament its absence, we're not so much lamenting our failure to achieve an ideal, but lamenting a loss and a wound to our human substance. Life in the body of Christ, life in the communion and solidarity of the church, is therefore not a new set of relations superimposed on humanity's natural life. It's the release of what we have forgotten or frustrated. Life in the body of Christ is a setting free of the solidarity in which and for which we were made. It allows our need for one another to be met because each one is set free to give into the life of the neighbor. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to note briefly some of the questions that arise from that sense of the church and the body of Christ in relation to where we are as a church at the moment. How should we think of the Christian church and of Christian ministry in the light of this vision of fulfilled solidarity, released solidarity? Ken Leach, again in The Sky is Red, has a couple of eloquent pages paying tribute to that very remarkable parish priest, Alan Eccleston, whose long ministry in inner city Sheffield became for many people a kind of icon of what parochial ministry might best look like. But reading those pages and reading many of Ken's pages on pastoral ministry, I would say it's very hard to map this onto the current culture wars afflicting the Church of England. On the one hand, to put it in very crude terms, there are those who see traditional parish structures as possibly useful, but not precisely at the cutting edge of the church's identity. The church's mission is to continue to create dedicated, educated, committed communities of disciples. And because people no longer live in quite the same way in localities as they once did, the church has to be nimble and flexible in moving away from an over-reliance on traditional parochial identities. On the other side, this is seen as a typically modern managerial strategy. It ignores the depth of implicit religion. It ignores the deep sense of trust in the availability of the local church, which is still quite surprisingly prevalent in so many communities. Where does Ken stand on this? His discussion of Alan Eccleston tells us quite a bit. On the one hand, 
He reminds us that Alan Eccleston's parochial ministry depended on a highly articulate sense that the church was not just there as an occasional adornment for the life of the community around, not just an emergency service. Alan Eccleston worked tirelessly to build up a community of prayerful, critical, difficult, intelligent lay people, a community of prayer and questioning, bound together by a faith in the distinctiveness of what was made possible in Jesus Christ, a sense, in other words, of being the body of Christ. At the same time, Eccleston spent all those years in his Sheffield parish because of a profound commitment to locality, knowing that his first task was just as much accompanying that community as it was building up the body of disciples. And you can only accompany if you are genuinely alongside. So perhaps we need to free ourselves from some tempting but unhelpful binary oppositions here. Programs about mission and ministry and new strategy, campaigns to save the parish. Perhaps all of them need to go into the melting pot and re-emerge, having engaged a bit more deeply with what solidarity means. Solidarity certainly means, and Ken emphasized this again and again, certainly means accompaniment, being there, patiently, unjudgmentally there alongside, walking at the rate people can walk in their journey towards life and death and God. And yet, the church doesn't accompany simply in the sense of uncritical affirmation. Its job is not just to reflect what the majority of people around believe, even the majority of, as we might say, right thinking or even left thinking people around believe. The church is what it is in Christ, the release of an already eternally existing solidarity, which we have lost. To sustain that, we need an intense life of distinctive discipline, profound prayer and reflection, the kind of life that Ken writes about so eloquently in so many of his books, the kind of life exemplified in his own ministry. And the church does not seek to set up a rival kind of solidarity to the society around. It seeks to show and to speak of the roots of lasting solidarity and true and universal mutuality. We try not to create yet another subgroup in society. And at the same time, we try to avoid simply being a vague religious gloss on society as it is. We seek, so Ken would have us believe, to live out the mystery that has made and has remade us human together. And that being human together, recognizing and answering wherever we find it, our need for one another, that is ultimately what Christian solidarity amounts to. Thank you very much for the opportunity to reflect on this and thank you for listening patiently. I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowan. Uh, thank you for giving us such depth to that word solidarity. At this point, we were hoping that my colleague Meg, Meg Warner would be able to give a brief response and question to you. But uh, as you know, Rowan, Meg was struggling with her voice earlier on, mm. and that's got steadily worse. Oh and so she has reluctantly 
um, had to pull out. So perhaps I can just offer a very brief comment and question to you before we come to some of the uh, uh, questions we're already getting uh, through the chat. Um, if I understood you all right, uh, I, I really appreciated the way in which you identified that paradox for us uh, between on the one hand needing to recognize the otherness of uh, people whom we are in contact with, in relationship with, to, as it were, recognize the borders and boundaries that do exist, the reality of them, mm -hmm. in order then to make them, if I can put it this way, places of meeting rather than places of division. And I think that paradox of having to hold those two sides is something many of us live with, mm. as you say, when issues particularly of gender and race come up, uh, where we have to admit our own inability very often to truly um, know what it is like for the other person. Mm. And yet we long to build those bridges, to make those links. And I think to, to hold that paradox, I found very helpful. I, I wonder as a brief question to start us off, I could just ask you whether, um, having explored a number of words connected um, or, or uh, inadequate words to link with solidarity, um, I guess a word from my non-conformist background and indeed from uh, our scriptures is the word covenant mm -hmm. and I wonder whether you feel that has any links with the idea of solidarity and risk uh, and whether Ken Leach had you that was a word that Ken Leach used at all. That's a very interesting question thank you. Um, I, I don't know the answer in detail about what Ken might have said about covenant, I, I could start looking it up um, with interest. I don't think it's something that comes very much to the fore in his thinking, but I'm quite prepared to be shown that I'm wrong about that. But let's think about what it might mean in this connection. A covenant, I think, is precisely the promise to, to be there, to stay there. Um, God makes covenant with God's people, um, and that means that God is to be their God. And that is how God defines God's self from this day forward. God is that God, the God who is there for them. Um, the people accept that covenant and accept that their integrity together depends on a shared faithfulness to that place which they hold in the purposes of God. So yes, there is, I think, um, a deep, sense there that the covenant between God and humanity to start with is about a kind of stability of relation, a flow of mutual service and presence, and that then we could say spills over into how we understand covenant between human beings, whether it's the particular forms of covenant that we're familiar with in, in marriage, let's say, in monastic commitment, in other kinds of promise and vowed stability that exist in the Christian community. We declare that we are there for the other, and that that being there for the other will define us. We won't try to slip out from under it. So I think there is a good deal that could be said about covenant in the light of some of what I've been reflecting on in um, relation to Ken. But uh, I, I'm just looking at the index of one of his books here to see if there is, in fact, any reference to, to Covenant. Um, and uh, I don't see it, but I will now go off and trawl through and see what, what might emerge. Well, I must do the same as well. But certainly, as you spoke, it was one of those themes that sprung out at me, particularly the risk that God takes in covenant with us. Mm. Um, and thinking that that linked with some of what you were to mm. speak to us about. Very much so. And, and somebody, well, more than one person, but I'm thinking of one particular Roman Catholic theologian, says that God's decision to be the God of this people means, of course, that God 
so to speak, renounces the safety of self-definition and allows God's self to be, if you like, associated in people's minds with the history of particularly humans. Mm -hmm. Just as when we stand alongside someone, we take on board the ambiguity, the light and shade of that person just by being there with them. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are affected by that. Our self-definition is not left safe. We, uh, we are sometimes tarnished by association. We're sometimes enhanced by association. But that's, that's the way it goes. That's the risk. And to use the word in your lecture title, transformed by it as well at times. You could say, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Let me come to some of the uh, questions that we're receiving. Um, Anthony Hutchinson asks, and this is just a summary of what he says, how does Ken Leach's theological sense of solidarity connect with holiness mm. and overcoming othering and scapegoating? Mm. Wonderful question, um, because you're absolutely right, of course, Ken is concerned above all with, with holiness, not, um, not at all in a pietistic way, but looking at the way in which a holy life is bound to be one in which we are we allow ourselves to be connected with god and with one another in ways that are risky uncomfortable compromising and all the rest of it and i've sometimes reflected i think i've done so in print here and there on the way in which jesus says in john's gospel in the farewell discourses that he is going to sanctify himself he's going to make himself holy as he goes forward to the cross he makes himself holy by standing in the middle of human humiliation and suffering and all, all the rest of it and i think ken would say that is exactly our own call to holiness it's not a call to separation it's a call to identification and in that moment of stepping in and being alongside that's when holiness becomes real just as god's holiness is supremely shown in god's identification with us in the the vulnerable and suffering life of jesus mm. Mm. question from rebecca nickel is it true that the in group seldom recognizes its own tribalism it's absolutely true and that's why anything that I or anyone else can say about this is bound to be subject to scrutiny from those who don't belong to the particular in-group of Anglican theologians or whoever it may be. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I think, one of, one of the regular functions of the in-group, one of the things that allows it to persist, that it doesn't see what it lacks. And again, I've, I've sometimes talked about how we think of the church, the integrity of the church, one holy Catholic and apostolic. And I've more than once suggested that maybe we need a fifth mark of the church, one holy Catholic, apostolic and penitent. That is a church which is always ready to be told what it's not seeing. And when I think of the last few years, I think with you know, some pain and some personal penitence of the things we've learned that we haven't noticed. The, the Church of England, like other churches, has had to wake up to a history of collusion with abuse. Last year, in the wake of Black Lives Matter, the churches and many other institutions, charities, universities, and so forth, including some I was involved in, looked at the ways in which they'd colluded with racial injustice. We were being told what we had not wanted to see or recognize. And I think to be in any sense a church with any integrity is to be willing to, to listen to that and to learn. Mm. The, problem, the problem of the, the really satisfactory in-group is that it, it's based on the premise that there's nothing to learn. Mm. And I guess a comment here from Savvy Hensman, <laughs> picks up that a little bit in the sense that he speaks about the way in which 
the solidarity that people may have with victims of a regime, for example, or indeed victims of those abused in the church, um, may experience be experienced as a lack of solidarity by the leaders yeah. of that regime or indeed of the church. Uh, and so the re reality that the reality is that to respond to others' pain may well not be free pain for everyone, uh, especially those who have status, whose idols are threatened, suggests Savvy. Yes, yes, thank you, Savvy. That, that's a, a key point again. Um, it's not as if solidarity is a sort of instantly healing and reconciling process, because the priority in the practice of solidarity is, of course, to be with those alongside whom nobody is standing. And that can feel like walking away to others. But this is where the whole basic point of mutuality comes in. If it's really true that we have this fundamental hunger or need for one another, then working to set free, to honor, to, to heal any human being is actually for the good of others, including the ultimate good of the oppressor. St. Augustine says somewhere that the problem of oppression is not only the insult and damage and abuse inflicted on the oppressed, it's the inhumanity that's cultivated by the oppressor. The oppressor needs to be released. And to end an oppressive situation is in the long run good news for the oppressor as well as the oppressed, but not quite the good news the oppressor wants to hear, which I take it is what Savi is, is underlining there. Um, in, in other words, it's a, I'm, I'm sure that somebody like Archbishop Tutu would have said to uh, President Butter or whoever in South Africa, getting rid of apartheid is actually for your own good. It's for the salvation of the souls of Afrikaners, not just the liberation of the bodies of, of black Africans. But that's not quite what um, President Bolta or others would have wanted to hear. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, thank you. Uh, question from Adrian Waite. Uh, there is, he says, uh, and who of us can disagree, a chasm between those disengaged from poverty and those trapped by poverty. How can we reconcile the two when there is a normative narrative that's often powerful, sees itself as wise in its own eyes, to, to, that's too powerful for us to easily listen to those trapped who is it who controls the narrative? Mm. Whose narrative is it anyway? Mm. Yes, oh my goodness, that's, that's an enormous question, isn't mm. it? Because it is, isn't the, it? The narrative, the narrative we are persistently fed in this country at the moment is a narrative which again and again slips back to the mode of saying, well, if there's poverty, it's... A, a minor problem, B, a transient problem, and C, probably, largely, the fault of people themselves. It's not a narrative which I think we ought to be telling, that the narrative of globalised economic forces pressing upon those already disadvantaged and driving them deeper into disadvantage. And how to break through that with the, the media culture we have and the political culture of short-term feel-good address, I, I really don't know. I, I don't see a great deal in mainstream British politics at the moment that is really effectively pushing back on this in, in any political party. Mm. I do see an enormous amount going on at the level of local communities. People recognizing that the problem of poverty is a problem of agency and trying to restore and support agency among those who think they've lost it. Um, just over a week ago, I was um, at an event here in, in Cardiff, which was celebrating some of the achievements of young people from minority ethnic backgrounds in community work and thinking, well, 
there actually is quite a powerful narrative being told at grassroots level in a number of places. How to bring that more audibly and more visibly into the larger public sphere is a challenge I, I find extremely difficult to, to, to rise to. We all, I suspect, do what we can in that respect. But I'm not holding my breath for a quick change there. I think mm. it's important to recognize and help our fellow believers to recognize the, the shallowness of some of the narratives pushed at us. We do need, back to Alan Eccleston, we do need that prayerful, critical, awkward questioning to be nourished in our church communities as best we can. Mm. Paul Vallely speaks of the uh, way in which in Catholic social teaching we have this tension between solidarity and subsidiarity mm. and um, the need to allow decisions to be taken at the lowest level compatible with good governance and wonders whether Ken Leach had anything to say about that at all. Not a lot that I remember. Um, although, because, because of who he was and where he was, he did know a great deal about community work, community politics, community organizing. And I, I think I'd probably look to some of his writings on race for some illumination there. But thank you, Paul. I, I think it's, again, it's a key notion here because subsidiarity is among other things a way of saying everybody and every community needs to be as responsible as it can realistically be for its own well-being its own well-working um, if if it's right that society itself is in the old phrase a community of communities then subsidiarity is not so much the, the subordinate bit of the picture, it's where it all begins. We, we learn our politics in any serious sense in that local level of engagement. And then we look for ways of building alliances and tactical coalitions between localities to broaden out to address the, the wider and more global social social issues. And it's all to do with the same point, the, the fundamental mutuality we're talking about, giving voice, giving agency, and seeing that as, as the basic reality. Again, I'll, I'll look again at Ken's writing on this. He, he doesn't, in a way, he doesn't have very much political theory, you could say, in, in his writings. A lot of social theory and excellent social theory. Um, I think he was actually very, very disillusioned and distanced from um, mainstream politics, as you might say. And the Christian socialism he espoused had, I think it's best described as a pretty patchy relationship with the life of the Labour Party in the United <laughs> Kingdom. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question that helpfully widens our perspectives a little further. Um, Dylan Parry Jones asks, do we need to extend our thinking beyond Western thought in order to truly understand solidarity? And he refers to the South African philosophy of Ubuntu um, and also uh, refers to indigenous Australians also. Um, and whether you have any reflections on that, Rowan? Well, Dr. Vaudil, then. Um, thank you for the question. Um, the, the short answer is yes, of course. And the um, Ubuntu philosophy is so much associated with the African world and not least with Desmond Tutu is, you could say, a particularly marked and dramatic form of solidarity thinking. It's all about how we, we can't be who we are without one another and so on. Um, but I just want to pick up that point about indigenous peoples, especially in Australia, because we are all, I think, surely at the moment, very, very conscious of the fact that in the, the Glasgow summit last week, the voices of indigenous people were largely silenced. And yet they're the people most obviously in so many cases from Australia to the Amazon 
on the front line of environmental crisis and environmental risk. And the kinds of, mm, the kinds of moral vision that so many indigenous communities seem to take for granted in terms precisely of mutuality and balance and in the fullest sense a sort of ecological cooperation. All those things which seem to be built into many indigenous people's philosophies and approaches to reality. We could have done with more of that at Glasgow because the, the fiction still persists that some countries can pursue their well-being with no consideration for the well-being of others. And that's not just a point about how bad and selfish that is, it's a point about how, how foolish and unreal it is in the long run because of who we are and the world we're in. So I'm very glad to have the reference to indigenous peoples just because it gives me an excuse to, to say that about that absence from so much of the Glasgow discussions, that shameful absence from the Glasgow discussions and certainly to underline what you said, Dylan, about the Ubuntu approach. And towards the end, a particular example of how the narrative gets controlled by the, the rich and the powerful voices in so many ways. Indeed. A related question, really, which we ought to pick up. What about solidarity? Someone asks solidarity with creation. Ah, brilliant. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm really glad that was raised because, of course, the mutuality we're talking about doesn't stop with the human race. The world God has made is a world of interaction. Everything is what it is because it is receiving as well as giving. And the whole idea of an ecology is the idea of a pattern of interaction, a sort of vastly complicated system of the exchange of energy and information. That's, that's reality, that's the world, that's what God made. And in that sense, I like to say that the non-human creation is also our neighbor and that the love of neighbor is bound up with the love of all those agencies and all those presences which contribute to the life that we lead. And so our responsibility in that is the care and nurture and of and respect for the neighbor that is the non-human world around. So yes, I think that it's a very proper point to make. And I, I think in any longer consideration of the subject, I should certainly have said more about that solidarity with, with the wider world. And just to underline the point in a slightly different way, um, I was taking part a few weeks ago in an event organized by a group called Global Witness, which is a network seeking to raise the profile of climate activists across the world who have been targeted for their activism and in many cases killed. Um, and it made me think that when we stop acting out of loving solidarity with the world around, we are very likely to be devoid of any sense of loving solidarity with, with human beings as well. In other words, the abuse of creation and the abuse of our human neighbor seem to go together as they do in these terrible stories of people who've been abducted, tortured, murdered by sinister and often rather anonymous forces who uh, coincidentally or not seem to be working in the interests of large exploitative, often extractive industries in vulnerable places as in Brazil or South Africa. Mm. A theological question from Vincent Manning. Is Christ crucified the exemplar of what you are meaning by solidarity? Ultimately, yes, I think, in that here is God, stepping into our world, taking a life of human risk, extreme human risk as God's life, not stepping back from that risk, 
walking alongside, I think, here of the risen Christ on the Emmaus Road, as well as the crucified Christ, walking alongside, not forcing the pace, and yet at the same time, not relenting on the urgency. Another of those paradoxes in the gospel, isn't it? Christ proclaims the kingdom as a matter of extreme urgency. And yet the last thing he ever does is to manipulate anybody into accepting what he says. And as I've, I'd like to point out, when the nine out of 10 lepers didn't come back to say thank you after they were healed, Jesus didn't run after them with a, a sort of membership form or punish them by bringing their leprosy back. He lets them go. They have to discover, they have to find out at their own pace what the implications of their healing might be. So both intense urgency and absolute accompaniment. And the cross is, is the center of that story, of course, of course. And I, I've always loved the way in which St. Augustine talks about Christ adopting our human voice, not to, again, not to silence our humanity, but to, to let our human emotions and our human passions have free expression before God. Thank you. We have already worked you quite hard, Rowan. I think we have time for a couple more questions, but I think that will have to be all. Um, a question from Keith Bander, um, and uh, one that I'm sure we will all be aware is there in the background for all our church traditions in different ways, and that is how the church offers solidarity with those of different sexual orientations, LGTBIQ people, um, whether Keith is, when he mentions the church, is thinking of the Anglican church or not, I don't know, but uh, maybe you can reflect from your own context. Mm. How do we offer solidarity? Mm. In the same way we offer solidarity to anyone. That is, first of all, we understand, picking up Pope John Paul's phrase, that dignity comes before solidarity. We recognize human dignity. That is, we resist any action in church or state that undermines, demeans, or denies the human dignity of any person belonging to a I don't like the phrase much, but let's use it, sexual minority. That's the first thing. Second thing is, are we creating a place where people are able to share, to give from their experience into the common experience of the body of Christ? The answer commonly is no, of course, but that, that ought to make us to think quite a bit. We're not creating such safe spaces. We're not welcoming what people have to say. And I'm saying all this conscious that there will still be disagreements about the theological evaluation of certain kinds of sexual expression. We're not anywhere near a common mind on that in the worldwide church, and we're not going to be in a hurry. But even, even if you hold a highly traditional view on that, which I don't, even if you have that, I think it's still possible to say, we recognize the dignity and we want to hear from you. We want to know how you have heard God and what of God you have to give us because we need it. And if we are silencing, demeaning, diminishing you, then we are in some sense saying no to what God wants to give. Therefore, we're not living in the fullness of solidarity. Those, those are the points from which I'd start answering that very large question but I, I would i would still hope that even those who do take a highly conservative view on this would see that those two things ought to be possible mm -hmm. and if they're possible they're necessary christina frederica comes with our last question this evening and apologies to all those who've submitted good questions that we haven't got time for. Christina asks this question, could you just say a little bit more to us about that idea of shared risk? Mm. How can the church begin to enter yeah. 
a little bit more into sharing that risk with others. Yes, I suppose, th thank you, Christina. Um, I suppose that first came into focus for me many years ago when my wife and myself spent a short period working for the church in South Africa. And it was in the apartheid era. And of course, the question was very much around, what does it mean to be in solidarity if you're a white Christian in South Africa with black Christians? And that was where I first came across people discussing this, this idea. Well, the only, the only thing we can do is not, not to say how sorry we are. We do actually have to stand alongside when, when the bullwhips and the police dogs are out. We do actually have to put our, our presence on the line in some way there. Now that's, you could say, a quite extreme instance, but it stuck with me as a sort of touchstone for thinking about what it, what it really means to be in solidarity. It means, I think, as I said earlier, being willing to be patiently alongside people with whom you don't have very much in common at the human level, and knowing that it's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be as uncomfortable for you as for them, but you know it's going to be uncomfortable. It can mean the, the risky kind of witness that some people undertake in activism of different kinds. It can mean the, the lower level risk, I mean, the risk to one's own comfort and security of the work of the street pastor in turbulent and rapidly changing and potentially violent situations. There's quite a, quite a range of things one could talk about there. And as I said, there, there are different sorts of risk. And it's, again, it's very tempting to think, oh, it would be really good to have something dramatic and obvious that I'm risking. And yet the person who, in a very quiet way, simply sets aside their comfort and security to do something very prosaic for somebody else, that's, that's on the spectrum of it too. And we shouldn't despise it and we shouldn't be romantic about how nice it would be if we could, if we could be literally out there with the bullwhips and the, uh, the police dogs. Th there, are, there are other ways of risking, other ways of being with. Um, the main thing is just quietly parking the urge to be secure. Mm. Yes, thank you. I can't help thinking that in some of the examples we see around us to, to just take those simple acts, what would, it have, what would it have meant if one or two people had stood up against racism at Yorkshire Cricket Club? Mm. Um, what if yes. more men yes. stood up against the attitudes towards women that express violence and disdain and so on? Yeah, simple things. Very simple things. And yes, that, that's, those are very good examples because, again, what happens when we see inappropriate abusive behaviour on public transport, on, on the tube or the train late at night or something like that? Are, are we going to be there with someone who's the receiving end? Yeah, as I say, it's, it's just setting aside that compulsion to be secure. Over to you, Ian. And I think Rowan's final question, are we going to be there, is a very good question to end with. Thank you very much, Rowan, for what has been very stimulating, thoughtful um, lecture for us and has brought an enormous number of comments and questions through the Facebook uh, chat and people have been so appreciative and so grateful and clearly more than that have been stimulated in their own thoughts both to question you quite deeply but also to agree with you and that's that's great 
that's that's really good. Uh, Joe Ford's just saying what an excellent event, and Lisette Larson Miller, wonderfully thoughtful and provocative. Thank you very much. Just before we go, could I just say to everyone who is following us here on Facebook that you will get an email about the um, about the recording and also questioning whether you may like a Zoom discussion to, among attendees, take up some of the points that have been raised as a kind of follow-up. But that's only an option um, that you might like to think about. But I will we'll explain how that could be done. I'd also like to very much thank our sponsors, um, the Luther King Centre for the Theology and Ministry in Manchester, represented by Graham here, who so masterfully took on the questions at the last moment, and also to St. Chrysostom's Parish Church, where Ken's Requiem Mass was held, and um, also the Society of Catholic Priests. Um, and th this little badge here is the badge of the Society of Catholic Priest. So, friends, do look out for that. It's an organisation which in many ways tries to take on, in thought, much of Ken's thinking. So thank you to all those organisations. Of course, the lecture is free and it always will be this lecture, but if you would like to give a donation, then we are suggesting that you may like to give a sum of money, five or ten pounds, say, to um, the, the Bikita project at St. Chrysostom's Church, which provides pastoral care through language lessons, clothing, etc., to victims of human trafficking here in Manchester. And that would, as you, I'm sure you would all agree, that would be a cause very close to Ken's heart. So uh, there will be a link in a moment in the chat facility uh, to how you can give, and it will also appear in the email that follows up this lecture. So again, on behalf, I'm saying thank you on behalf of St. Chrysostom's Church and the Society of Catholic Priests to Rowan. And um, Rowan knew me as a much younger person many, many years ago. And it's lovely to reconnect in this way. And I feel when I see him and hear him, I haven't aged at all, but, <laughs> but there we are. Compared with what you mean. <laughs> And over, over to Greg. Thank you, Ian. And I simply want to add my thanks to yourself, Ian, to Rowan particularly, and to everyone for being with us tonight uh, for a very rich evening. And perhaps I can end with these simple words of blessing to send us on our way. Now may the Spirit of God, who brooded over the waters, and brought order out of chaos, find a home in our hearts, and settle our minds as we sleep, that tomorrow we may wake to live to God's glory. Amen. Amen.